Hello and welcome to episode two of High on Award Season, a High on Films podcast series. Uh, this is still Virat Nehru and I'm joined still by Ron Meyer from the US. First of all, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all the love you've given episode one. I'm so glad that people still listen to podcasts in this oversaturated market where there are so many film podcasts. So thank you so much for the love. And uh, it's really heartening to see that so many of you have tuned in. So if you haven't tuned in, it's available on Spotify. This is my plug and my only plug for now, for the beginning. So if you haven't found us, please find us and listen to our first episode and tell us how you found it. But this episode, uh, first episode was all about the Best Director nominations, but episode two is all about the acting categories. And because there are so many of them, we've tried to kind of mix it up a bit, and we're combining uh, our Best Supporting Actor or Actress and Best Actor and Actress categories into one. So this is going to be a mega episode where we discuss all our acting categories. So Ron, how are we feeling about this? We have some have our first data points to go on because precursors like NYFCC and NBR have, have weighed in. Um, we also have some regional groups announcing their nominations. And uh, AFI just released its list. So nothing too out of left field has materialized, but a shape is emerging. What are the kind of early trends that you're noticing? Do we have any clear favorites that you think uh, are basically a shoo-in in any of the categories, in the acting ones? Well, um, so far, Lily Gladstone has gotten a lot of love. Um, yeah, I think people were predicting that Sandra Huller would be the critical sweeper for Anatomy of a Fall. Yep. But so far, Gladstone has really been um, the consistent victor. Um, also, not too surprisingly, critics have a lot of love for Charles Melton. I think, you know, this week, a lot of pundits have probably bumped him into their top five um and the, you know the, that reason the, the cause for that is sort of twofold uh, not only has melton been winning at you know he won the gotham um award he won at nyfcc um let's see did he win nbr let's just uh, pull up the list no, that was Mark Ruffalo for Poor Things. Well, um, still, I guess he the first major announcements, he was in those headlines. And that was happening right around the time that the movie premiered on Netflix. So it's having a moment, but who knows if it'll sustain, you know, into the next couple of months, especially as the color purple premieres and you know, if if Rustin has a minor resurgence and people are all talking about Coleman Domingo, there's no way that they don't also talk about his performance in what is likely to be a, a sizable hit at the box office. Talking about uh, NYFCC, which is New York Film Critics Circle, uh, I noticed, and I know you're going to be very heartened by this, that in the Best Actor category, Frank Rogowski won for Passages. Now, we were discussing in our Best Director possibilities whether Ira Sachs would ever get in in any alternate universe. But do you think, do you think that this has any impact on the Best Actor race where Rogowski can somehow sneak in or the critics are so out of touch with audiences anyway that this has no real bearing in how the universe is going to play out eventually. We just need to celebrate for now that passages get some recognition and then go back to the real world. These groups, they will, um, for the most part, they want to march to the beat of their own drum. Um, they only really fall. That's why Christopher Nolan winning best director 
is such a strong indication that there's a, that a consensus has formed around him because for groups like this to go with such a safe pick like Nolan, that must mean like it's sort of it's it's just locked and sealed, kind of like kind of the way they went for Chloe Zhao and Jane Campion. Um, okay. A year ago, though, Spielberg was not like the consensus, even though at first many people thought he was. And that sort of and so when they went with Raja Mooley, it was kind of like, OK, maybe it's it's it hasn't been like decided by the powers that be that everyone's just lining up for Spielberg. Anyway, the, the reason I'm I'm re- referencing the director race is just that like they will fall in line when there's an overwhelming favorite. But for the most part, they like to do their own thing. And Franz Rogowski is that sort of thing, just a kind of highbrow you're suggesting he's more like an outlier and not something that we should get really excited about that this is any sort of prediction come the academy awards of how I mean he's getting out. nominated by some other groups he's he's popped up on other lists but um yeah for a best actor nomination at the oscars that's like it it doesn't even make sense in the context of Andrea Riseborough getting a nomination for two Leslie because that had the whole like, like grassroots element to it and passages of or not 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 trendy is not the right word uh, a sort of hyper contemporary like risque story about polyamory I just don't see you know, to Leslie had this element to it that could really, I don't know, involve people from all walks of life. And I think passages is, you know, for people like us, but I don't see that having a lot of crossover appeal, not enough, at least to nab Rogowski or anyone from that movie an Oscar nomination. Uh, well, that is sad indeed, but you know, there are some kind of, Patterns emerging, like you said, Melton kind of winning Best Supporting Actor, which kind of sort of locks in that category that he's going to get a nomination, definitely, whether or not he's going to win. But at least that campaign has fared pretty well for him. Uh, Lily Gladstone winning Best Actress uh, sort of gives her a front runner kind of place with the Best Actress category. Uh, and yeah, I think the supporting race is more interesting uh, Davine Joy Randolph for The Holdovers, which, uh, you know, I think she's uh, gotten a lot of love for the film and for her performance, which I think is surprising for me because I didn't love the film that much, but I can see uh, that her performance Thank is really you. good. So uh, that was a big surprise for me, how the consensus seems to be forming around her for Best Supporting Actress, which I do think is a bit more wide open race uh, I think the best actor category and, and uh, best supporting uh, actor is kind of a bit more tight in terms of what the spots are. So it's it's interesting that uh, what do you think are some of the more, uh, I guess, more inventive places or sort of places that are still up for grabs, you feel, in some of these categories? I guess supporting actress. Yeah, that's, I, I, that's the safe answer. I'm I'm trying to sort of uh, steer that conversation there because if you look at the National Board of Review Awards, NBR Awards for 2023, and and their kind of top ten films that they're listing out, some of the films that make in uh, may give an indication. For example, we have The Iron Claw uh, in there, and uh, you know, does that mean? Zach Efron has a shot, clearly not. Uh, but you know, uh, just the fact Ferrari is in there, even though, I mean, why? Because there's nothing likable about that movie. Uh, but does it mean Adam Driver or Penelope Cruz have a shot in in, in the acting categories? Uh, which yeah, Penelope Cruz is someone that I did just say that supporting actress is probably probably has the most flexibility. And yeah, her cruise getting in would sort of 
indicate that that yeah there's probably more room for a solo nominee in that category than in the others which seem to be like very best picture loaded yes definitely uh, and and like you like you said um even though i don't like ferrari and i don't like the holdover as much either it's interesting to see that some of the performances from these films that you know i'm not very keen on seem to be sort of standing out and really making a mark uh even though ferrari either Adam Driver getting in or or Cruz getting in just doesn't compute in my brain at all because and that's just the star people love Penelope Cruz she she got in for Parallel Mothers which it still was Adam Driver's a huge star it's not about the quality of the movie in this case I think everyone is I I wouldn't be surprised if there are some people who don't see Ferrari but still vote for Penelope Cruz just as a kind of the, you know by default even even if the performance is probably not that impressive just on the basis of a name alone that's kind of sad hey, but anyway hey man it's a war season <laughs> i agree with you I know, sucks, I know but like but... I, I feel like i'm having a real life epiphany uh in real time you know it just it's dawning on me that on my list of just going out the window if not about Cruz. the quality of the work you mean <laughs> like yeah yeah wow it sucks leonardo dicaprio might just get in on name alone for killers of the flower moon i mean yeah with his uh permanently upside down we frown. know it's a it's a dirty it's a yeah we know that it it is not a clean kitchen but I know, but what 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 the hell was that expression? That sort of, sort of uh, half frown, half sort of droopy face expression that he had for the I think majority it had of the something film. Something to do with, I think they like did something to uh, his teeth, and that may have affected. Ah, uh, okay, so they they Marlon Brandoed him like the like Godfather, the shape of his lips, essentially. Yeah, yeah, possibly, and also it's just a really effective facial expression to use if you're yeah he 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 did look pretty pathetic i mean as the character not leo but yeah (laughs) but i did get sick of that one expression i'm just like can we just change it up a bit but okay okay yeah leo might get in too so (laughs) so some trends from um nbr and also the new york film critic circle uh anything from afi that sort of jumps out at you in terms of the results there oh let me look at it um american fiction barbie the holdovers killers of the flower moon maestro may december oppenheimer past lives poor thing spider-man across the spider-verse no um i think there was some up not uproar but some concern that the color purple missed out here um and i don't feel like regurgitating the same like possible excuses if you listen to others you'll get all the basic like rationalizations like oh it's screened too late um there was some screener issue whatever uh didn't make it in uh actually let's 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 start with uh the color purple because that's a nice kind of segue into the best supporting actress category. Uh, Daniel Brooks. Now, I haven't seen Color Purple, but Daniel Brooks is making waves for her performance and, and generally kind of the talk of the town. Uh, I can't gauge sitting here what the kind of temperature on the ground is, but do you think she has a chance to get nominated or, or what's the what's the feeling over there? seems like danielle brooks is an inevitability i think she's been yeah like the people who have seen it have all unanimously praised her uh, which again was to be expected um i've heard good things about everyone pretty much and well not like corey hawkins but i mean um holman domingo taraji p henson daniel brooks fantasia barino but uh, 
Danielle Brooks was always sort of going to be an inevitable front runner because of how well contenders from best picture nominated musicals fare in best supporting actress. Oh, fair so, point. Yep. Yeah, like even if the performance and I think she won a Tony for or wait, did she I think she may have been nominated for the Tony. But yeah, like the, the the performance was was always sort of it was expected for a long time she was good so nothing's really changed we've just continued like people who had her in their predictions are like oh i feel i feel really good about that like i was one of the only people and they're like no like i think everyone looking at that package knew i mean i think for the longest time we all kind of thought that two supporting actress slots were going to the color purple for books oh. and henson yeah okay. um if anything's changed maybe it's that taraji p henson isn't a sure thing maybe you know that buzz is declining as the buzz for julianne moore is increasing yeah because may december just premiered on netflix yeah. and also um there was like a sort of social media round of uh, a video of the real Mary Kay Letourneau being like completely pathological during an interview. Um, <laughs> and I think I know I myself, like I've never really seen or um, heard Mary Kay Letourneau speak. Yeah, but also but when you e even though that video, you realize like, oh, wow, Julianne Moore like impersonated this person quite well. Even though the movie isn't like a direct yeah, exactly. adaptation of yeah. her story. But no, I, I completely agree with you. I think um, even though Melton seems to be a lock for Best Supporting Actor, uh, Julianne Moore deserves it for Best Supporting Actress as well. But we're not talking about deserving it. We've just established this is not the world we live in. We, we you know, People get in by name recognition. And I do think Julianne Moore also has the name recognition, so that's fine. I think it should be okay. Uh, and talking about my predictions for Best Supporting Actress, uh, I, I do have a couple of surprises, which I know you're going to bang your head about, uh, because, you know, this is the world that I live in. <laughs> so I have got Danielle Brooks for Color Purple. I've got Julianne Moore for May December. I've got Devine Joy Randolph for The Holdovers. So far, so good. You know, so far we're still in the realm of reality territory. But I've got Sandra Huller, not for Anatomy of a Fall, because that's the lead performance. I've got her for the zone of interest in Best Supporting Actress. Uh, I do think out of the two performances, this is the one I prefer. And I am very, very surprised that nobody's talking about her performance in the film. It's all been about Glazer... As a, and it's all been very direction or best picture focused or even cinematography focused. There's not much buzz about the acting performances, which does kind of make me feel a bit sad. Uh, and finally, the biggest, biggest sort of, and you're going to probably slam your head in the wall, is that I've got Cara Jade Myers for Killers of the Flower Moon as a possibility of sneaking in. <laughs> so do what you will with that. But those are my five. Brave. <laughs> okay, my supporting actor. <laughs> I, I, um, I think Ron just went speechless for about for about a minute there. So yes, that was the real time shock settling in, guys. <laughs> um I'm probably going out on a limb predicting uh, this person in first place, but I have Jodie Foster for Nyad. Mm -hmm. um, not that this is like serious analysis, but Matthew McConaughey won an Oscar when True Detective Season 1 was airing. Mahershala Ali won his second Oscar when True Detective Season 3 was airing. And guess what's going to be on HBO, or excuse me, Max, when Jodie Foster will be up for Nyad. So, yeah, yeah, like, that might be fun. And if that happens, I will believe in, like, 
magical coincidence. Look, if if, um, if you can apply that theory for Jodie Foster's possible nomination, then I'm feeling a lot better about my brave chance. So that's okay. <laughs> well, yeah, but also Jodie Foster is a Hollywood icon and Kara Jade Myers has like two and a half seconds in Killers of the Flower Moon. She has no profile. Like, what in what world is it? I'm saying Jody Foster. <laughs> you understand that, right? Jody Foster. Mm-hmm. Like, how many Oscars does she have? And Kara Jade Myers, uh, remind me, what, what, what was she known for before Killers of the Flower Moon? <laughs> is she even known for Killers of the Flower Moon? Like, Go speak to any normie about Killers of the Flower Moon and like, yeah, what would you think of that cast? Oh, yeah, loved Leo, you know, Bob De Niro and, you know, the the Indian chick who played, you know, his wife. They probably don't even know Lily Gladstone's name. And you think like, like Cara Jade, my, I mean, yeah, okay, I guess, I guess, sure. Jodie Foster, Cara Jade Myers, what's, what's the difference? I mean, yeah, okay. So, you, so you're not I you're not so Jody fast Foster. about not so fast about Sandra Huller for Zone of Interest that I've got. Um, I can see that sort of being like I don't know. I can see that in like a this isn't a good comparison, but just in terms of the feeling it would give me, kind of like Jesse Buckley getting in for the Lost Daughter, sort of like. Or or um uh or like Jesse Plemons getting in for the power of the dog like that was a good okay, that was a good it. good comparison Jesse Plemons for power of the dog oh my god yeah just like yeah like oh didn't expect it but makes sense I actually before I had seen the movie I mean I for the longest time I actually did think Sandra Huller had a better chance for the zone of interest just because of how like complicated the role is to just mundanely play a monster um without any of the bells and whistles available to you yeah um but given how the conversation's been going yeah it doesn't seem likely but again not something that would like completely blow me away okay so that's that's not see i i I did the right thing i put it an even more outrageous choice in there so you wouldn't notice my less outrageous choice, which is Sandra Huller from Zone of Interest. So in comparison, it feels Brilliant. a bit more normal. Good strategy. See, it, it all works out. <laughs> Sorry. Up to yours, which probably I think are more sensible than mine. So you've got Jodie Foster in there when I add. I mean, that's, but maybe the problem is that I'm a little too in tune with this conversation. And so I kind of participate in that I think because Honestly, like for the longest time, I've thought Leo is gonna. I think even, I'm trying. I think even before I saw Killers of the Flower Moon, I suspected that Leo might get snubbed. But now it seems like everyone is thinking, "Oh, Leo might be the you know the the, the shocking snub." And you start to wonder, like, did I did I think that a while ago or? Did people just start talking about it and I'm like implanting a false memory? And I don't know, like we're all just in every category. We're all pretty much bandying about the same permutations. Like maybe um, like if it's not Oppenheimer, perhaps it'll be um, American fiction or the holdovers. And like that's something I've been thinking about for a while. And seemingly everyone else is on the same page. So you know that's not what is going to happen, and something must be at play that is leading us all to the same conclusion. Um, I think you just need to yeah, be I don't know. in another continent at another end of the world where you're not in the conversation to come up with these radical permutations that I have. So there is that. So. I have, like I said, Jodie Foster, Divine Joy Randolph, Danielle Brooks. I should probably put Danielle Brooks in first place. Um, yeah. I think Emily Blunt gets in for Oppenheimer, even though in Oppenheimer, apart from Killian Murphy, the film is not designed to give anyone well, 
we like, Robert Downey yeah, Jr. Yeah, exactly. We'll we'll sort of where you make get that to, argument, Robert get to, Downey Jr. Get to the get to that. But but the thing is, none of the women are important in that movie. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah, no, I but she just she does exactly what you need to to like it's because the movie it, itself is going to be such a a hit like yeah. in all of these different categories that you think like well she does more than enough to coattail and by doing more than enough i don't mean she's good enough i mean on paper she does what you need to, to for get, me think, for me and this is my screen yeah for me and this is my actual hot take Cara Jade Myers and Killers of the Flower Moon and Emily Blunt give the same pedigree of performance in both their respective films. Right? For that I can agree with. <laughs> so... But see, it's like, <laughs> no, 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 wait, wait. So you so you just hit on something important. <laughs> okay. You're saying the quality is is commensurate, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. But that's Emily Blunt. Like a beloved actress who been in the wings waiting for an Oscar nomination forever for a movie that is probably, I mean, yeah, Killers of the Flower Moon does have pedigree. So, like, let's take the movies out of it. You have, it's like the same quality, but one is Emily Blunt in like the likely best picture winner. And Kara Jade Myers, who has like no name, who gives a performance that is just as unimpressive as Emily Blunt's. Like, Okay. Yes, if you can get in for an unimpressive performance when you're Emily Blunt, even, which is funny to say because she does, she's never been nominated for. But my point is, you can get in for an unimpressive performance when you're a major star, and when you're a major star that is overdue. And this might just be like the most sort of rational time to throw a nomination your way. But you can't get in for an unimpressive performance when you're. Who again? What? I already forgot her name. Like, she's... I'm sorry. <laughs> Look, logically, I understand what you're saying, but because I've seen poor things just last night, and as Emma Stone says, or as Bella Baxter says in that movie, sorry, that I believe that society can be improved. So I believe this process of picking the same people every time and how we converge on the same names can be improved if it takes a radical sort of, you know, pretty looking retard, aka poor thing like me, to make that change or suggest some new names in the picture, then so be it. Then, I'm happy to be that person. Fair enough. But then use that platform for someone who, like, you just said yourself. Wait, let, let, me, let me make sure my logic is, is sound here. You don't think Emily Blunt gives a good performance in Oppenheimer. You think and Cara Jade Myers gives a performance of equal quality, which means you also don't think that Cara Jade Myers is given a good performance. So how are you improving society or, you know, awards discourse by predicting her? Like, sure, throw someone out there. Ben Wishoff for passages. That improves. Like, like, if if Cara I could, Jade if, Myers, if I could, on. if I could put in Ben Wishaw as best supporting actress, I would. Okay. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> but the okay. other options uh, I, I I was tossing up, Rachel M McAdams for uh, "Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret." Uh, uh, which I just watched that this week, actually. Which I, I do think she gives a darn good performance. And I do think Rachel McAdams is extremely underrated as a dramatic actress. People sort of keep boxing her in as a comedic performer. And she's brilliant as a comedic actress, don't get me wrong. But I think she has incredible dramatic chops. And there was a bit of a period where people were starting to talk about that this could be uh, a movie that has that potential to kind of give her that platform, but then it kind of faded away. So that would be my other realistic slotting in, in there with Rachel McAdams in Best Supporting Actress as a nomination. Not saying that she's going to win, but she deserves a nomination. For, and also, in terms of a known name, if you're going that logic, 
a known name who has a brand, but can do with a bit of change in the stereotyping that's been with her performances. So this nomination in a dramatic category might get people to think about her pedigree a bit differently. So I think that in that sense, it might do well for her. Uh, and it is a very good performance. I did enjoy that quite a lot. So uh, if I'm coming back to the real world and I'm thinking with my actual brain in my head, now that it's been put back in and sewed back in, uh, thank you, God, Godwin Baxter, for sewing my brain back in. I'll put in Rachel McAdams in there. There you go. Sorry, courage in my <laughs> Um, America Ferrera has also been talked about. I mean, I don't know why, but whatever she has it's possible. One monologue in Barbie, yeah. which is being repeated ad nauseum, and that's about it. But just, just, yeah, just, but she has, she kind of has, you could say she sort of has an overdue narrative, not that she's been in many. Oscar vehicles, but she has she's more been around for a while. She's more to do in a film like Dumb Money, which is terrible. But she has more of an arc in that film than in Barbie. Yeah. What are we talking about? Might as well hand it out to Dua Lipa for playing a mermaid. <laughs> um, and maybe uh Viola Davis can sneak in for air. I would really like to see that happen. Oh, but, okay. Uh, um, I, I, I didn't I like know, air, but Doc but I Sort of falling. I didn't like air as much. I I I know I know you've loved air, but I I can see that. (laughs) But I love uh, air. But when when Viola Davis's performance was like kicking into full gear, in my head it's like this is such an Oscar Beatty performance. This is like this is this is definitely trying to go for a nomination. So yeah, I I can see that. Um, let me. See if we've missed any obvious picks here. Um, just gonna go with Gold Derby's rankings. Um, look, the only other kind of possibility: Joy Randolph, Daniel Brooke, Emily Blunt, Jodie Foster, Taraji P Henson, Julianne Moore. We talked about Penelope Cruz. Talked about America Ferrera. You briefly mentioned Rosamund Pike. Sandra Huller, Viola Davis, Rachel McAdams. And then, yeah, you get into Vanessa Kirby for Napoleon. And I, 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 do, I do, I do think, I do think actually going back to Saltburn for just a brief second, and I'll never go back to it again because it's a terrible movie and it just burns my insides. Rosamund Pike was definitely the best thing about that movie. And she is having a lot of fun. And I did enjoy her playing uh, this kind of, incredibly latest character with so much having a lot of fun uh, after a long time i think uh, it was quite refreshing to see her in that kind of mold these are it i feel i i don't see anything coming out of left wheel for best supporting actress it's one of the more uninteresting categories this year i'm i'm sorry to say it, it doesn't inspire me much I mean, it's more interesting now than it was in like August before we knew that Lily Gladstone was campaigning as a lead because then the category was pretty much sewn up and now almost anything seems possible. By the way, one person I forgot to mention, one of my favorite performances of the year, actually, so it's shameful that I'm only remembering it now. Um, Claire Foy and All of Us Strangers. I, oh. I would much rather see her get her be the overdue British actress that like gets in this year instead of Emily Blunt. Interesting, because I don't see anyone talking uh, about any of the sort of female performances in that film. It's all been Andrew Scott or Paul Mescal. So that's an interesting choice, and I can see that. I can I can definitely get behind that. I was just not thinking of it from that perspective because when I think of all of us strangers, I'm only thinking of Andrew Scott and Paul Mescal. Like that's how I'm that's framing. No, no, I'm. Uh, oh, okay. I, I maybe after your 
interview, which was very illuminating. I need to go and rewatch that film and, and give it another shot because I wasn't as impressed by it. And that's, I'm realizing that that's probably more on me than the film. I need to go give it a proper shot again and, and see it for all its merits. Um, and not make it as much of a stranger as it has been in my life. So that pretty much wraps up, I think, our supporting actress conversation, unless you have something you'd like to add. No, no, that, that that's about it. The supporting actresses are... Okay, let's move are, into are supporting done. actor. Yes. Um, oh, yeah, that is that This is, category that is, fun. is sort of weird because it seems like the top five is pretty locked, but then there's so many people i don't know there there are like there are two names i can see dropping off here and being filled by one of like i don't know six actors or so i mean um, definitely i think the supporting actor conversation is the most interesting in terms of the permutations it can throw up even though when you first look at the the prediction locks they feel quite certain, but then also not. You know, uh, my five predicted are Charles Melton for May December, Robert De Niro for Killers of the Flower Moon, the other Robert, Robert Downey Jr. for Oppenheimer, uh, Lorraine Gosling for Barbie, and then Willem Dafoe for Poor Things. Now, I do feel both Willem Dafoe and Ryan Gosling can actually be swapped out. And then there is a whole bunch of permutations of people who can come in to actually take one or both of these slots. Uh, that's how I'm sitting. Uh, Melton wasn't as much of a lock, but now that he's sweeping so many of the categories and the precursors, I feel he's quite a lock. So, uh, Robert Downey Jr., De Niro, and Melton are kind of locked in for me. But Gosling and Defoe, not so much. I can see... Actually, I, I've sort of been thinking about how this race might be similar to the same one in uh, for the 2012 year in movies. So the 2013 ceremony honoring 2012 in film. Uh, when yep. Best Supporting Actor was, um, who were the nominees? Alan Arkin, Argo, Robert De Niro, Silver Linings Playbook, Philip Seymour Hoffman, The Master, uh, Tommy Lee Jones, Lincoln, and uh, the eventual winner, Christoph Waltz for Django Unchained. So I'm sort of thinking like, in this year's version of that, Robert Downey Jr. is Tommy Lee Jones, uh, Robert De Niro is Robert De Niro. And <laughs> I don't really know who the analog would be for Philip Seymour Hoffman. But my point is that Willem Dafoe is Christoph Waltz. So for that to work, Mark Ruffalo would need to be Leonardo DiCaprio, who gets sort of snubbed in favor of his senior co-star. And that's actually something that's sort of a trend we've seen recently, um, like Judy Dench getting in over Katrina Bell for Belfast and a year ago, Judd Hirsch getting in for the Fablemans, even though um, Paul Dana was like more widely predicted, but he was snubbed and Hirsch got in. So I'm thinking like, yeah, what if mark ruffalo doesn't make it in charles melton takes that spot and then somehow willem dafoe like comes out on top i don't know why i just think it's which would be in both you know given i've just seen poor things last night i was very taken in by his performance uh it was very affecting and and also overall i think it's lanthimos's most kind of pat a paternalistic role, yeah. sort of like Christoph Waltz's and Django Unchained. Yeah. Also, poor thing is Lanthimos's most, uh, most. Uh, emotionally affecting film after a long time, maybe because he was set in doing these kind of emotionally detached style of films with Killing of a Sacred Deer and The Lobster. It's good to see that he can actually make a film which has a, a beating heart. <laughs> 
you know, as to yeah, say. And you can argue that beating heart is Willem Dafoe. Oh, definitely. And it, it, and it, it did kind of make made me sort of uh, out of all the performances in that film, I think Dafoe was the one that really got me the most. So that's why I put him in there, even though I think, you know, Mark Ruffalo easily has a case to make. He's having a lot of fun in that movie. It's fun to see him have fun. So yeah. Uh, but yeah, if you if you go in the kind of wish list territory, there are a lot of other names. But before I go in there, I want to see your name if uh, you have anything different in that list or predictions. Uh I don't have Mel yet he's like right outside my top five my yeah. number one is robert downey jr followed by willem defoe followed by mark ruffalo followed by robert de niro followed by ryan gosling but given and this is just what i, I wrote down a while ago given what i just said obviously i think um yeah, I mean, if I think Ruffalo's the likeliest to fall off, then I shouldn't have him in third place. That doesn't make a lot of sense. But I don't know. I just, I see Ryan Gosling or Mark Ruffalo falling off. Mm -hmm. A lot of other people on see Robert De Niro being the one that misses. I don't know. I think Robert De Niro has... I, I don't think we should judge his potential for a nomination this year by his sort of absence on the 2019 trail for the Irishman. Because, like, he's playing a villain. I think this role allows him to kind of tap a little bit more into what he was sort of displaying in Goodfellas as Jimmy Conway. I, I don't love the performance, but I just think he, he has, he's, he's much chillier. And I think he has a greater impact in this film. So anyone who's like, oh, well, he missed for the Irishman. I, I don't know. I think that that had less to do with De Niro and more just with like the quality of the role and how Al Pacino was really Al Pacino and Joe Pesci were the highlights in that movie. And in this film, you could say DiCaprio is the one stuck with the dopey role. And yeah, no, I, I completely uh, agree with that analysis here. Yeah. That's that's spot on. Yeah, Melton is obviously a possibility now. I thought he was a possibility from a while ago. Then I sort of got off of it because four things premiered and everyone's like, oh, well, Willem Dafoe and Mark Ruffalo are both getting in. There are no two ways about it. Um, but now again, like he's... Even though I expected him to do well with precursors, I didn't really have him in, but now that it's actually happening and I'm seeing it and I'm seeing the love on Twitter and, and all the headlines, it's like, yeah, it's it's very easy to see that panning out. Um, Coleman Domingo, also a possibility for The Color Purple. Sterling K. Brown, maybe for American Fiction. Um I once thought, like most people, that John Magaro or Majaro, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, was getting in, but just too many things have happened since past lives was yeah. in its heyday. That it, it, movie it, it, might have a resurgence, but I think the beneficiary of such a resurgence would be um, Greta Lee and like Celine's song in screenplay. I think Ma Majaro is just. Yeah, on my on my wish list categories, I did have Sterling Gay Brown, American Fiction. I have a lot of love for American Fiction in general, and I think as a film and and all the acting performances are excellent. Uh, I also have Jeffrey Wright and Rustin as a possible supporting. Uh, you know, uh, I know. Uh, barely there in the film but the impact that he has for the screen time is is immense and i just had a lot of fun uh watching him do his thing uh, i really hope i mean this is my real fingers crossed praying moment is that this is jeffrey wright's year he gets in for best actor for american fiction uh and he gets into best supporting actor for rustin that would be that would be sweet 
I will take everything else. I can be wrong about anything else, but if these two things happen, I will be I will be on the moon. I think yeah, that would that would be amazing. Just perfect. I've also got Paul Mescal. Pretty strange given that um like Coleman Domingo is predicted to pull off that Scarlett Johansson play, getting two nominate getting nominated in two categories his first time around. Um yeah, no one's really talked about Jeffrey Wright for um Rustin. I agree it's a really good performance and he makes the most of limited screen time. But yeah, Rustin is Coleman Domingo or nothing. Okay. This is once again going back to sad territory where people just don't know what they're saying. So we're coming back to more interesting stuff. Uh uh, I've also got Paul Meskel for All of Us Strangers as uh, an interesting sort of supporting to Andrew Scott. Uh, if I had to pick one, uh, he was terrible in foe, but you know, in as the as a two hander with Andrew Scott in All of Us Strangers, I think he fares a lot better. Uh, and I need to give that film another shot as well. So I, I've got got him in there in the possible conversation. Um, and obviously Josh Magaro who past lives, but that seems like, you know, a past, past life. You know, it doesn't seem to be happening in this life. So that's that. Those are the kind of main names that are kind of popping up for me for this category. But that's mostly because, uh, uh, Willem Dafoe and, uh, Ryan Gosling are sort of dicey for me. Either Willem Dafoe is going to win it outright or he's going to fall off and be replaced by Mark Ruffalo for poor things. Uh, which is crazy to think about that, that either Dafoe, if he's in there, he might win it or he might not get nominated and just be replaced by Mark Ruffalo. <laughs> also look out for Dominic Sessa for the holdovers. And uh, one interesting possibility, Matt Damon getting in for Oppenheimer. I don't uh, think yeah, it's very I've, likely. I've read about that. And... But what if that's like the surprise? Du- like we, we're expecting double nominations, but what if it's just not the double nom we're expecting? So, for example, like a year ago, people were thinking, oh, the double nom and supporting actor will be Paul Dano and Judd Hirsch. The double nom and supporting actress will be uh jesse buckley and claire foy for women talking but then the double nom and supporting actor ended up being banshees of an issue which by the way like that was to be expected by the time the nominations were actually announced but at the beginning of the season you didn't think oh brendan gleason and barry keegan you thought i i feel like most people were on the fablemans getting a double nomination train um, and then in supporting actress, instead of Foy and Buckley, the double nom was Stephanie Sue and Jamie Lee Curtis. So I'm thinking, you know, what if instead of the poor things duo, it's actually Robert Downey Jr. and Matt Damon for Oppenheimer? Matt Damon for Oppenheimer? Uh, okay. It just deflates everything. Like that just, I don't know. That sends me off into a. Zone of interest spiral. Okay. <laughs> Damon does enough in the movie. He shouts. <laughs> he has a big shouting scene that lends itself to an Oscar clip. That's true. So that's that. I think that wraps up our supporting actor categories. Yes. And and now we move into... Actually, wait. Just, just one second. I would like to see Christian Friedel possibly nominated for the zone of interest i think really? like if he and sandra huler both get in that would just be so look delicious. the thing is like, uh, look now you're even, so it, dryly funny now you're even going way past my uh, sort of craziness like i i, I could have put in sure, i don't huler think it's gonna happen it'd yeah. just be fun yeah it would be fun it would be fun <laughs> uh, and a lot more interesting in that sense um so now we uh, move why into. Do you want to do actor uh, or actress? Let's actually change it around a bit. Let's let's do best actor first and give keep best actress for last. So we, we okay. since since that we're not sure. I mean, 
since we're not following convention in any sense of the way anyway. So it's okay. We can break convention here too. And people would argue that actress is uh, the the more exciting category. Oh, yeah. Okay. So uh, the five names for best actor in terms of my predictions, I've got Hillian Murphy for Oppenheimer, of course. Leo for Killers of the Flower Moon. I've got Jeffrey Wright for American Fiction. With Bradley Cooper for Maestro. And I have put in Andrew Scott for All of the Strangers to round off the fifth spot. Uh, which I think is... So, wait, who are you missing? So you have Killian, Bradley, Leo, Jeffrey, and Andrew. Yes. So you're leaving off Holman and Paul. Uh, yes. Uh, I... Okay. I wasn't taken in by Paul Giamatti, but seems like he is getting a nomination for the holdovers. It seems very, very likely given how the award season precursors have panned out so far. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know about Coleman Domingo and Rustin. I, I know there is a lot of uh, love behind it, but I just don't. See it translating into a nomination. I've got it in my wish list. I mean, he's a very much a very high possibility, but I don't see him in the predictions uh, to actually making a nomination. Uh, it's more likely that Paul Giamatti replaces Andrew Scott for the holdovers for that fifth spot. But apart from that, everything else seems quite locked in. Yeah, I have. Um, uh, I don't know if I should have Bradley or Killian in my first slot. I mean, Bradley Cooper has the physical transformation, but every day I'm just reading more thirst tweets for Killian Murphy. I don't really know. But, but know Killian that. also has the physical transformation, right? There was all this buzz about how he only ate almonds while on set. So he. Oh, sure. He. Physically starved bit, himself. But I mean, yeah. But I mean, come on, we know what I'm talking about. Like, he's not wearing pounds of makeup. He's not wearing any prosthetics, except for a very uh, short moment at the end. He looks like himself. Uh, yeah. Bradley Cooper, on the other hand, is, you know, doing... He's He's aging as the character. He is... His physicality sort of transforms especially when he's conducting i think the movie is a very likely makeup and hairstyling winner and we've seen how that can kind of match with lead acting win so jessica chastain and brendan fraser being two recent examples uh though of course bombshell won makeup but that didn't boost charlie's theron in a actress uh so yeah i mean i guess I'll put Killian Murphy in my first slot. Um, I'll follow that with Bradley Cooper. Uh, and then I don't know. I mean, yeah, it could be Jeffrey Wright. could be Paul Giamatti, Coleman Domingo. Um, I think Coleman Domingo is amazing. I don't really see how he could possibly miss, but... I don't know, because the movie isn't quite taking off, maybe that will tank him, but he's just it's such a baity performance in the best possible sense of the term. Um, I would think like I think with Bradley Cooper and Coleman Domingo, you have both ends of the spectrum. It's like, here's what a good Oscar bait performance is, and here's what a bad Oscar bait performance is. Uh Andrew Scott, I mean, may I would really like to see Zach Efron have a chance for the Iron yeah. Claw. That's probably yeah. not going to happen. But he if is on my like, sort of wish list in terms of making it, sneaking in, hopefully. But it's a big, hopefully. I've also got Nicolas Cage from um, Dream Scenario as a, a, a maybe to sneak in if he can, because I did love his performance. Probably get a Golden Globes nomination. But for an Oscar nom, nah, no. Like, I know, but yeah, like honestly, if, I'd if I'd love to get him in. I don't think I'd love to uh, basically swap out 
Andrew Scott and slot in Nicolas Cage in there and also swap out Leo if I can. Um, but I don't think that's happening. It's really possible yeah, that think... Paul Giamatti gets in instead of Leo. It could be Killian, Paul Giamatti, uh, Nicolas Cage, Jeffrey Wright, and Bradley Cooper. Uh, that's also a possible yeah, I mean, limitation, but who knows? Nicolas Cage getting in for a zany, surreal comedy when like, he had a, a, a minor but somewhat realistic chance for Pig, and that didn't work out. I, I, I would be astonished if Dream Scenario took him any further than like a, a comedy musical nomination at the Golden Globes. I mean, it would be um, the Dream Scenario. Uh, huh. <laughs> okay, uh, actor is pretty thin, I guess. Once you yes. get out of the top contenders, uh, there. But I, I do, I do probably... kind of uh, see your point. I, I do kind of wish. Zac Efron also sort of some love for the Iron Claw. Also, I know that this was a conversation at some point, but T.O.U. for Past Lives, along with Greta Lee, uh, one for Best Actress and one for Best Actor, but the T.O.U. campaign in the bandwagon has completely fallen off, so I don't think A24 are campaigning for him for Best Actor anymore. Uh, So it's just Greta Lee for Best Actress. So it's, it's yeah, it's sad, it would but I be do wiser think... for eight. It would be wiser for a twenty four to put their best actor chips behind Zac Efron. Yeah. So we shall see how it pans out. Um, but that's that's mostly it in terms of the acting, uh, best actor category in terms of the main contenders. To be honest, it's let's move over to actress. Uh, unless unless you do feel Frank, uh, we've had this conversation already. Unless you do feel Franz Rogowski is actually going to make a nomination after the New York Film Critics Circle, but I don't think that's happening. So yeah, yeah, I just think that's them being, you know, their kind of coy, contrarian selves. It's like they have to do the artsy European thing every year. I mean, if they're going to fall in line for Christopher Nolan. They have to kind of be colorful in some regard. So yeah, Franz Rogowski is just that like sort of sophisticated ball out of left field. That was a weird phrasing. I'm going to have to edit that out. Um, <laughs> okay, moving on to Best Actress. Uh, should I read... Gold Derby's odds. Do you want to do your list and then I'll do mine? This yeah, let's 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 let yeah, let's go with the Gold Derby's odds. Yeah, let's see what they've got. Okay, uh, in first place, Emma Stone, followed by Lily Gladstone, followed by Carrie Mulligan, followed by Sandra Huller, Fantasia Barino, Margot Robbie, Annette Bening, Greta Lee, Natalie Portman, Haley Spaney. That makes up the top ten. Yeah, I don't really see any. Yeah, Helen Mirren for Golda, that's not happening. Tiana Taylor, 1001. That would be way too, that, like, the only way I could predict Tiana Taylor for 1001 is if I'm, like, forcing myself to analyze this season as if it's previous season and she is Andrea Riseborough. That's, yeah, no, not, not uh, anything we need to seriously concern ourselves with. Um, I think, but yeah, like I wouldn't be surprised any person in this top 10, like anyone below five, Margot Robbie, Greta Lee, Natalie Portman, Kaylee Spaney can see them all getting in. I think Annette Benning is a top five contender. I can yeah. actually see her being a Sandra Bullock, um, um, Rami Malik type sort of populist insurgent. Um, some will argue that, well, really like Nyad hasn't been getting any buzz and it's like that's true but we've also only been hearing from critics and Nyad is not i think that's something that would probably speak more to regular voters so when we do get into the televised ceremonies like golden globes sag yeah, yeah. I, I would watch out for annette benning 
The only change I, it's probably not wise for me to have her at number one, but like I do seriously think that like Golden Globes will split between you know the respectable picks like Lily Gladstone and Emma Stone or Carrie Mulligan and Emma Stone. But I think once we get to SAG, it'll it's sort of like the trajectory Jessica Chastain followed. Like that's where she sort of popped and then went on to win the Oscar. I don't know. Perhaps the, the the comparison is more flawed than I'm currently realizing. But yeah, I think Annette Benning is is a serious possibility for Nyad, especially because of the strike and the role that she played in managing this like entertainment fund. I mean, that's the narrative you're going to keep hearing over and over again for Annette Benning. She's overdue. It's you know, it's 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 a sports drama, not too different from King Richard, which obviously got Will Smith an Oscar. Um, and yeah, like she was a major factor in the strike act. You know, this may be like the best way to kind of reward her and to I I don't know. No, I I see I see where you're going with that, and I understand uh, that sort of sort of sentiment in trying to reward Annette Benning for not only a contribution to cinema, but also a contribution recently with the strikes and everything else. So uh, I can see that kind of a campaign being a massive hit. But still, I have got Lily Gladstone at number one uh, in my kind of order. Uh, I think there is no way she can be kind of... Ever since they moved her from supporting to best actress, I think it was done very deliberately with the main possibility of not just getting her a nomination, but making sure she wins. And how Leo, De Niro, and even Scorsese... It was actually all done to make room for Kara Jade Myers. Let's do that. <laughs> Well, Ace Veronica's <laughs> laughter didn't tip you off. Yes, I'm being sarcastic because. <laughs> well, but also it's interesting that you say it was done to ensure that she wins because they definitely threw her in the tougher category. Supporting actress was sewn up; it was gonna be hers. That they moved her to best actress is uh, so it, it so definitely you, didn't make the road so, ahead so, easier. So you think they killers of the flower mooned her by actually just pretending to give her a, a better category but actually ruining her real chances. Ah, oh, that's nice. That's... <laughs> actually, yeah. That's that's not a bad way of looking at it. <laughs> I mean, no, she can still win. I mean, I didn't think she could win a few weeks ago. I still don't think she can win. But, you know, again, these, these precursors met matter but they don't matter and often they you know like you you see a couple headlines in succession that one person has won multiple awards and you think like all right i guess like it just you you become conditioned to seeing them win stuff it doesn't like you know cody smith mcphee won a bunch of awards for the power of the dog but ultimately that went to at the oscar went to troy kotzer and I kind of think the same thing is going to happen to Lily Gladstone. Like, yes, this is a respectable pick, but ultimately they're going to go for the more obvious performance. And that could be Annette Benning, That could be Carrie Mulligan. Um, that could be Emma Stone. Yeah. But yeah, what she did, she, she's not really a lead in that movie. And when she is on screen, I think she's excellent, but it's a subtle performance. And yeah. it's it's the kind of thing I can see critics recognizing, but but not not Academy voters. Okay. We'll hopefully see if subtlety is winning this year, or maybe not. So we have Lily Gladstone. I have Lily Gladstone at number one. I've also got Emma Stone at number two. Then Sandra Hullard, number three, Carrie Mulligan at number four. And to round off my top five, this is my sort of, sort of, you know, chaos in the mix is Jessica Chastain for memory. So I, I, I see her sneaking in 
and I know you're smiling at that because I know how much you love the film. I love. I would love to see that. I, I think she gives one of the five best performances of the year, male or female, regardless yeah. of category. I think she's yeah. incredible in that film. So uh, I've taken out Margot Robbie because I don't think in in, in an acting performance uh, thing, A, I don't think her Barbie's arc was that impressive, even though she is the lead. There are a lot of other things going in Barbie's favor, uh, which I don't think a Best Actress nomination is really warranted for that film. Uh, you know, you can get the Best Director, Best Picture, Best Supporting Actor for Brian Gosling with his arc as Ken. It's way more compelling and, and way more interesting. Uh, I mean, for not being a contrarian and sort of no, don't want to ruffle any feathers, but I did feel uh, Robbie's arc was one of the weaker links of the film. Uh, uh, so I don't see her as a lead kind of sneaking in, given Jessica Chastain is right there. She's right there for the picking. And she also has an equal pedigree, if not a better pedigree than Margot Robbie in terms of the name. So we're taking off the yeah, name, she's, she's the name winner. problem. Yeah. So she's got she's got the name thing taken care of. So she can, if she can carry that and she can carry memory into more of a spotlight, then it'll serve better for memory as a film as well because it'll get more attention. So it works well both ways. Uh, more people get to see memory as well, which I think should be a given. So I'm very lucky to have seen the film this year. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, apart from that. Uh, you mentioned all the other probables, so nothing really stands out. I'm thinking Greta Lee for Past Lives may have a chance of sneaking in, uh, but that's about it. Uh, I'm not sure if Annette Benning, you've made a very compelling case, and I'm reconsidering in my head in real time now if Annette Benning has a case, but if I'm going by sort of my already kind of preformed logic. I think Greta Lee has more of a shot than Annette Benning, but it's also all about timing. So Annette Benning maybe have timed her kind of campaign a bit better and has more recency bias towards her with the strike and everything else. So the narrative is very different to what Greta Lee had first half of the year in terms of his uh, standard performance in the best film in the first half of 2023. That feels like a long time ago. But other than that, yeah, those are the kind of uh, best actress category performances. And I will keep my fingers crossed that Jessica Chastain doesn't only get nominated, but maybe just win the category. So that would be interesting. Oh, the nomination would definitely be the win. I don't think she has a chance of actually taking the award. But um, yeah, I would... I would love to see her get nominated. Uh, see, see, this is the ideal world. You have Jeffrey Wright for American Fiction winning Best Actor, Jessica Chastain for Memory winning Best Actress, and that's it. I'm I'm not putting any money on that because that's not happening. But you know, if if I was ever every... two ideal picks and supporting, then ooh, two ideal picks and supporting. Ah, oh, interesting. Ooh. <laughs> Definitely not Cara J. Miles. Andra Huller for <laughs> Zone of Interest. Yes, and... uh, I would, I would, I would, I would pick Sandra Huller for Zone of Interest, and uh, okay, and Willem Dafoe uh, for, for Poor Things. Yeah, you were really taken by yeah, that. Yeah, so Dafoe for Poor Things for Best Supporting Actor, and Sandra Huller for Zone of Interest uh, can easily be Julianne Moore for May December as well. It doesn't matter either or. Uh, but yeah, those. All right, so I'm just gonna run through my predictions. You're not gonna hear any names that we haven't already mentioned. Yeah. Again, I have Annette Benning in first, but I don't. I yeah, that should. I just I don't see Lily Gladstone taking it. So you know what? I think I'm gonna put Emma Stone in first. Yep. Um, I'll put Lily Gladstone. No, Carrie Mulligan in second. Oh, Lily really? Gladstone in third. Do you think Carrie Mulligan yeah, is that Carrie big of Mulligan. a shot? 
no, again, I, I, I really think it's either going to be Emma Stone or Annette Benning. I don't think uh, Gladstone or Mulligan can win. I don't think Hooler can win. Um, Mulligan also has the overdue narrative. And yeah. she does give a very Oscar-friendly performance. She cries a lot. There's <laughs> the physical transformation. Um, I mean, if Maestro wins makeup and hairstyling but cooper doesn't win actor perhaps she can still win actress and keep this trend going of the uh, makeup hairstyling acting uh match mm -hmm. but no i don't think she actually has a chance i think emma stone is likeliest to take it but i do believe annette benning will somehow just prevail and like she'll be i remember you know, watching Sandra Bullock just rise in uh, 2009. Um, wait, not getting the year wrong, am I? No, 2009, the year that, ah, Carrie Mulligan was actually con contending for her first nomination in education. Uh, yeah. Gab Gabory Sidibe was uh, contending for Precious. Sandra Bullock, and then, ooh, what were the other two? I'm not going to be able to remember this while we're recording. Um, all right. Just moving on, moving on, because I'm going to get stuck on... Wait, no, nope, that was 2010. Melissa, it was 2008. Okay, but just... But still, those were... It was Gabby Sidibe, Carrie Mulligan, Sandra, B Sandra Bullock. They were, like, the major contenders, I believe, that year. And... Out of nowhere, Sandra Bullock just somehow became um, the favorite. And then I guess that kind of sort of happened with Rami Malek. And I just, I don't know. I don't know. I have a, I have a hunch that Annette Benning will be that kind of contender this year. Okay. So. But if it's not her, then, I mean... I, I think I'm what you know, you just saw poor things. So the impact of the performance should, you know, be way heavier on you than it does on me at the moment because I saw the movie in October. How how do you give it to to Lily Gladstone or oh I mean Carrie Mulligan was good in Maestro, but I don't know. Emma Stone does something really special in that film. I and I know. Just great overall. Like she's on the curse, uh, the show from Nathan Fielder and Benny Safty. She's she's just excellent in that as well. She's just a great, very versatile actress. And perhaps I'm letting my preferences get in the way a little bit, but it's only because my preferences seem closely aligned with the odds. But yeah, I think Emma Stone should definitely take it over. I I, I think that's so much that I can't even envision. Lily Gladstone or Carrie Mulligan winning, even though it makes sense on paper. I just, I don't know. I don't see those performances inspiring enough passion. Whereas Emma Stone's performance in Poor Things, I mean, she's going to be, I think she's going to, like Bella Baxter is going to become an iconic character. Oh, and, I agree. Yes, 100%. Sure, 100%. Saying, Ryan yeah. Gosling's performance has already, like, you know, gone into that sort of realm of pop culture, but he's also playing a pre existing character. And, you yeah. know, Bella Baxter is just like her creation. Well, I mean, I, I guess if you want to be pedantic, it's, it is based on a book, but as far as most audiences are concerned, like, that is a character Emma Stone sort of pulled out of thin air. I agree. Yeah. And, and people are going to talk about furious jumping quite a bit. So, uh, I'm, su I'm sure a lot of the sort of Bella Baxterisms are going to be quite popular after the film. Yeah. I mean, she's going to become like, I mean, honestly, yeah, it's it kind of, like in the way that Gosling inspired all of these Halloween costumes. I I kind of see that being the case next year when a lot of people have seen poor things and they're going to like dress up as Bella Baxter. It's just she has like this Tim Burton-esque aesthetic. I mean, I guess you can say. No, actually, that, that's, a, that's a really, really good that. point. Um, this is the closest film I can think of 
which looks like a Tim Burton film, like an old school hand-drawn Tim Burton film, uh, not made by Tim Burton. You're absolutely right. It has that gothic sensibility of the older Tim Burton films before he moved towards digital and, and didn't do hand-drawn stuff. So the film does kind of give that impression, uh, even though I did feel that the length kind of wore me down a bit and it could have been half an hour shorter. But still, it, it, it's very impressive. Uh, and the wall building in, in Poor Things is very creative and costumed as well. So I think Bella would be... You're right. Yeah, I can see that. So we, we Yeah, and see. if not her, then Annette Benning again, just it's just the feeling. Like it's it's I just have a strong hunch she's going to kind of emerge as that popular sort of populist. I don't know. We we overuse that term, but just that yeah, like in a sports drama that is so widely accessible. It, yeah, like I'm just I'm getting blindside King Richard Bohemian Rhapsody vibes, and even though the movie hasn't taken off yet, I feel like it it eventually will, and that the reason it hasn't is just that only critics have really been weighing in, and like yeah, of course, a movie like Nyad is not going to be platformed by critics, just like you know the blind side was probably not mentioned by many precursors in 2009. Okay, so now that we've run through all of our predictions and honorable mentions, I guess we're just going to do like a gender neutral um, ranking of our favorite performances from the year. Um, mine, my favorite performance of the year, I think is probably Killian Murphy. It's like, safely one of the best performances of all time so really my list is just killian murphy and everyone else uh if i were voting for the oscars i'd probably give him the award uh followed by him i have robert downey jr also for oppenheimer not gonna offer much commentary here because i can say a lot about that performance it's great i think of all the perform yeah so again these this list um disregards categories so and gender we're just mashing up all of our favorite performances in a ranking uh yeah my number one killian murphy followed by robert downey jr in third place i have phoebe dynever for fair play in fourth place coleman domingo for rustin followed by jessica chastain in memory uh then kelvin harrison jr for chevalier not a great movie, but a really great performance that further demonstrates Harrison's range between Waves, Loose, uh, This, even Cyrano. Uh, Emma Stone for Poor Things. Merritt Weaver for Memory. That's not a perform. Whenever anyone talks about memory, the conversation is either about uh, Chastain or Sarsgaard, uh, Peter Sarsgaard, who won the Volpe Cup in Venice. But I think Merritt Weaver is fantastic. I would personally nominate her for Best Supporting Actress. Not a possibility, but she has one scene where she just like, like whenever anyone talks about Charles Melton's performance in May, December, they, they say how he like physically emulates a, a, a child that, or like, an adult that's in arrested development. And, you know, I, I don't know. I didn't, I wasn't that impressed by Melton in May, December, but I do think Merritt Weaver accomplishes that in this one scene in memory when she has to confront her mother and she just physically kind of like, like in, in her mannerisms just reverts to being a child and like nervously pulling at her shirt and just kind of saying something that's been a long time coming yeah i don't know Merritt weaver was like phenomenal in that film um and then i have matt damon for air a lot of people are going to call me an idiot for that but screw you matt damon was awesome in air he is consistently great and undervalued he was also great in the last duel which required him to be two different 
versions of the same character. I don't know. Matt Damon's just always great. Uh, and then rounding out my top 10, I have Ben Wishoff for Passages. And then I have a bunch of honorable mentions, which I thought were appropriate because I didn't only include my far-fetched kind of preferences here. I did include people like Killian Murphy and Robert Downey Jr., people who are uh, Emma Stone, people who are definitely getting Oscar nominations. So I do want to make room for people who, you know, don't, who really don't have a shot. Uh, Julia Louis-Dreyfus for uh, You Hurt My Feelings. Claire Foy, well, Claire Foy does have a shot for all of us strangers, but I still want to mention it because I think it's one of the best performances of the year. Annette Benning and Jodie Foster for Nyad. Chris Rock for Rustin. Viola Davis for Air. Uh, Jay Baruchel for Blackberry. I know most oh, people wow. love Glenn Howerton in that movie. Okay. I just thought Baruchel was very, like, just just it gives a really quiet yet expressive performance he just he just communicates intelligence really well um paula beer for a fire andrew scott for all of us strangers morgan freeman for a good person a good person is an okay movie but morgan freeman's great in it reminds you you know that he's still morgan freeman and yeah, uh, Zach Efron for the Iron Claw. In fact, he probably would have been in my top 10, but I, I didn't want to run the risk of um, exhibiting recency bias. So I put him in my honorable mentions. But yeah, Zach Efron in the Iron Claw is amazing. His like the final scene of that movie is all thanks to him, like one of the best final scenes of any movie this year. And yep, that rounds out my list. What about you? Yeah, uh, my top 10, some of these names obviously have already been mentioned, but some of these haven't. But just in terms of putting them uh, in an order is interesting. My favorite performance this year has been Jeffrey Wright in American Fiction. So that's not a surprise in terms of how much I love that performance. Uh, I think in a black comedy, doing something that affecting is really difficult. I think given the genre of the film, uh, he gives a dramatic performance in a black comedy while being very funny and also balancing the serious elements really, really well. I don't think that that kind of performance gets noticed enough uh, because of the genre and the category that he's playing in. So I think it's a very difficult task. I don't think... We make enough good black comedies to begin with. So there's also that. So American fiction is kind of an anomaly in a lot of ways. And I think it was just a brilliant film in that sense and led by Jeffrey Wright in that sense. So I really, really was taken in by it. Number two, I've got Jessica Chastain from memory. I, you know, completely, ever since I've seen the film, even though it's not been that long, I cannot get the film out of my head. I cannot forget anything about the film. Uh, and more than Peter Sarsgaard, I do think Jessica Chastain was the performance that really sort of took me in. Even though Peter Sarsgaard also gave a very good performance, if I had to pick one, and something that I really kind of uh, sort of think about. Also, the physicality of it, in terms of how she gets to convey uh, so much of her anxiety and, and the kind of uh, how much of her body remembers uh, what she's gone through physically, I think, uh, was a very, very accomplished performance. Uh, then I've got Ben Wishaw for Passages at number three. Uh, I think Ben Wishaw deserves a lot of love. I know I mentioned Lilting in our first episode. I do think, I hope people check out some of his uh, earlier work uh, and sort of jump on the bandwagon because Wishaw is amazing and I feel uh, sort of, you know, he deserves more love. And then we come to the more conventional picks. Killian Murphy at number four, Lily Gladstone for Kill of the Flower Moon at number five. Uh, and then Sandra Huller for Not an Enemy of a Fall, Zone of Interest. Then Nicolas Cage for Dream Scenario and Frank Rogowski for. That is a really great performance. I kind of actually, I want to like just retroactively include Nicolas Cage on my list. 
Yeah, Dream <laughs> Scenario is really good. He's really good in it. But I'm sorry, you were saying. Frank yeah, that, that's okay. Sorry, uh, Nicholas Cage, Frank Rogowski, and then rounding off Paula Beer for a fire. So that's that's mostly okay. it. But I did want to sort of highlight Jeffrey Wright, Jessica Chastain, Ben Wishow as some of the more accomplished performances, which may not even make the final nominations card, but I do think they really stood out for me. And then you have the more conventional names that obviously feature in. So yeah, those those were the the main kind of acting performances that really stood out, and I think it's a it's a pretty nice spread. And I know we were talking about maybe looking at acting as a combined category. I do wish I'm not sure if there's ever going to be a change to the Oscars format, but I do think we can just have a best actor and and a best supporting actor gender neutral category. You don't need to have a best actor, actress, supporting actor, actress categories separately. So an acting performance is an acting performance. A supporting acting performance is a supporting acting performance. It doesn't matter. And and once you look at it holistically, actually, the kind of list you come up with is it, very different. It, it does give you more variety and more permutations and more combinations to think of. Uh, yeah, I think actually this is probably a good, you know, the Gotham's do a gender neutral acting award. And yeah, uh, Lily Gladstone, I won there, but for the unknown country rather than Killers of the Flower Moon, which we can safely assume was just sort of like a combined honor. And, uh, she beat, let's see, let's quickly review. The Gotham nominees. She beat Jeffrey Wright for American Fiction. Uh, Kaylee Spaney for Priscilla, who of course won in Venice. Uh, yeah, Franz Rogowski popped up here to Greta Lee. So, I mean, the only people... So, I'm just going to read all of the Gotham nominees. Uh, Anjanu Ellis Taylor, Origin... Greta Lee, Past Lives, Franz Rogowski, Passages, Babatita Sadio, Our Father the Devil. i sorry if I mispronounced that. I've also never heard of this person or this movie. But can I say I'm just like... Just got yeah, just, just from, a, from a couple of names in, in this list, it obviously Michelle Williams was showing up. I don't think there's any love for the new Kelly Reichardt, even though I, I, I love Reichardt as a filmmaker. I wasn't taken in by showing up as much. Uh, um, I, I don't think that's one of her better films. So, uh, And I wasn't taken in by Michelle Williams as a, a performance in this film. I don't think it's Reichardt's better efforts. I think she's made many other better films in the past. So that's why I wasn't really uh, looking at that in a conversation. And yeah, Kaylee Spaney for Priscilla. Uh, I don't know. Uh I I don't know what the buzz is around that. We haven't really uh, got um, a screening of Priscilla happening here at, uh, yet, so not sure what the buzz is. Uh, but yeah. And in supporting Charles Melton beat Juliette Binoche for The Tastes of Things, Penelope Cruz for Ferrari, Jamie Foxx, They Clone Tyrone, Claire Foy, All of Us Strangers, Ryan Gosling, Barbie, Glenn Howerton, and Blackberry. Sandra Huller, The Zone of Interest, Rachel McAdams, Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, uh, and Divine Joy Randolph, The Holdovers. The only real uh, Oscar contenders on this list are uh, Ryan Gosling, Divine Joy Randolph, and maybe Penelope Cruz. You know, I can see in some weird world Juliette Binoche breaking through for the taste of things. It is, no pun intended, a very palatable film. Um, <laughs> I don't know. That might be like something to look to look out for. It, it'll. I mean, she'll have to pop up in a couple of places before the Oscar nominations are announced, of course. But like, I'm. I don't know. I have like one sort of ear out for that um yeah but it is fun to look at gender neutral categories because obviously the, the competition's a lot tougher 
Um, and I mean, it's just sort of, it says something more about the quality of the performance. Um, exactly. I, I, I do think, wins. but I do think, uh, given this exercise, when we're looking at gendered categories, we're trying to fill in those performances from a specific lens of who gave a best actress performance or best actor performance rather than, you know, who is deserving. So, you know, that kind of gives in those permutations of who can fill in the spot rather than uh, when you look at a gender neutral performance category, it's just like, oh, these are kind of locked in. You know, this is, these are the best performances, period. We We don't really need to try and fill in spots. So there is less sort of, you know, mathematical equations involved and more, okay, these performances were great, essentially. Yeah, just, but as far as the Gothams are concerned, they're, I mean, I know we're just talking about gender neutral categories, but I do want to quickly throw in that the Gothams aren't like, you know, a year ago, Daniel Deadweiler um, won best performance beating out i think kate blanchett michelle yo maybe even a couple of other eventual nominees but obviously daniel deadweiler didn't even get nominated for an oscar so yeah i i don't know i wouldn't look at this list and be like oh charles melton is getting in but still charles melton might get in though not because he won a gotham just because that performance has consistently been winning, popping up on lists. Uh, so yeah, whenever anyone asks, like, you know, do the Gothams matter or do any of these precursors matter? It's like, no, individually they don't, but in the aggregate, they kind of do. Especially when over and over again, you see in a headline that someone has won, like, maybe that doesn't influence academy voters but that certainly influences other regional groups and then by the time oscar nomination oscar voting rolls around i mean yeah yeah like e even if this has zero impact on voters you win enough precursors i mean at the very least even if that's not registering with voters that is still signaling something to awards publicists so it's like yeah you can say precursors don't matter but if charles melton ends up winning all of these precursors you can't say that his chances of getting a best supporting actor nomination were always the same that before he won a bunch of precursors he was just as likely to get in because no winning again having your name in all of these headlines even if that doesn't have an effect on voters it does sort of fuel a campaign from like the 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 end of a public like a, a, a publicist or a studio has a better idea of what is worth backing in their sort of camp based on a lot of these precursors so it's like because melton is winning all of these awards and and landing all of these nominations yeah, if Netflix before was like, oh, yeah, we're going to, you know, he's, he's going to be one of our contenders. Now they know, like, no, he's our horse. And they're going to back him a lot harder than they otherwise would have. So, you know, every year I feel like we have this debate, like, do precursors matter? And you have some people who are just like, yes, everything matters. And other people who are like, no, because critics don't vote for Oscars. But I don't know, it's just a little bit more complicated. Like, Yes, they matter. No, they don't. Do the Gothams in and of themselves matter? No. Do they matter in the, or rather, do they sort of matter fractionally when combined to sort of create a picture of the entire season? I mean, yes, yeah, sort of. I mean, they, it, the bigger picture, the, the aggregate, that matters, especially when you have publicists and studios deciding where to sort of allocate their resources well so so that brings us to the end of our second episode uh, uh we went through a lot uh, there was a lot of categories a lot of combinations permutations so do let us know if uh, some of your favorites didn't make the cut or make the list and 
some of your favorite acting performances uh, from the years that, that has uh, gone by. Uh, we'd love to know, and we'd love to sort of argue about it and, and sort of tell us why we are wrong, because we are critics and we are always wrong. So, you know, happy to know uh, what your taste is uh, and who your picks are. Uh, uh, we'll be back with our next episode, which is going to be all about best picture, you know, the big one. And for that, we do have a special guest. Is that right, Ron? We have someone coming on with us. Yes, we have something in the works, but whether or not it's confirmed, we we won't reveal uh, the name on this episode. Exactly. Just like the suspense for but Best next Picture. Next time it'll be a trio, not a duo. There we go. Uh, so just like the suspense for Best Picture, we are not revealing who we are going to have uh, joining us for that discussion, but I'm very excited to to weigh in on that discussion because it's going to be uh, very, you know the big discussion that we have uh, as we move on closer and closer towards Oscar season. Uh, this has been Virat Nehru and Ron Meyer uh, with you, and thank you for staying along, and uh, see you next time for Episode 3 in Best Picture. Bye. <laughs>